Welcome to another episode of What Are You Reading? What Are You Writing? A weekly video podcast features creatives, writers, and readers when we come together to talk about books. I am your host, Karen E. Osborne, author of four novels and counting. I am so glad you're here. I think you're going to enjoy our next guest. I am so glad that you have joined me today. Thank you so much. I want to introduce you to an amazing writer. His name is Peter Geddes, and he comes to us from Australia. Hey, Peter. Hi, uh, Karen. It's lovely to be talking to you from Australia. I am so delighted. I've actually visited Australia three times. Not too many Americans can say that. No, true, true. So um, Peter is a journalist. He's a radio script writer, a documentary film producer and director. He's also husband to my dear friend, an amazing author, Willa Hogarth. And Peter's new book is called Peter's War. And it's it's a funny, sad, funny, I said that, I know, but I want to get that funny, sad, funny in there. Um, it's gripping. It's a World War II memoir written from the point of view of young Peter. And I, I'm so privileged to have read it before it came out and so love it. And so I'm excited about talking to you about it. So you've had a very varied writing career, right? So all just different kinds of things. Why did you decide to write a memoir? Why? 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 When? Uh, I just became, as I aged myself, I became really, and, and my parents died, my grandparents had all died, and I thought, wow, I didn't know anything about these people. I, I just knew them more or less from the point of view of a child growing up with my grandparents and my parents. And I thought, I should leave something for my children because I, you know, my children only met me <laughs> when I was in my 20s, uh, so I thought they might be interested to know I was also very aware that people, younger generation people that I hang out with, they not too sure about the Second World War. Was that sort of back in Henry VIII's day or something like <laughs> that? There's a little, a little uh, confusion. So I just sat down and and started writing it for my children. It was just a, just a little gift to them, if you like. I thought they might be interested when I was dead to read it, and uh, that's what got me started. Plus, I was old and retired, and uh, I had time. Well, you chose, though, you picked a time in your life that was quite traumatic. You picked a, a time of trauma. Um, did you, have you processed, had you processed all of that before, or did that become part of the processing while you were writing, or how did... How did you deal with the, the hurt? I don't think initially as a young man that I was aware of, of it. I wasn't a particularly aware person, but as I became older and uh, was in a relationships and got to know myself and other people better, I, I became aware that I was really... Uh, injured, if you like, uh, by my childhood. I, I, I carried a lot of that stuff around. I, I wasn't a very good parent. I, I emulated my parents. Uh, I wasn't one of those dads who said, oh, hop into bed and I'll read you a story. I was more likely to be down at the pub or something. You know, I, I just wasn't, wasn't there. And uh, so I, I I'd done a lot of work on that stuff. By the time I was writing the book, I had a pretty fair idea uh, that I wasn't the perfect parent, for sure. Um, and I think as I've gone on, you know, in the I wrote the book about 20 years ago, and sort of since then, like it just sat around. It was just just part of my filing cabinet, and uh, 
Willow had a friend who was an assessor here one day and she just happened to come up while we were having a cup of tea. And uh, she said, oh, I'd like to read it. And when she did, <clears throat> she said, oh, you should publish this. This is really interesting. I said, oh, really? <laughs> I'd better check with my children first, but whatever. Anyhow, that's, that's, that's where it came from. <clears throat> And since then, and now that I'm older than my parents were when they died, I, I, I have a hell of a lot more sympathy for them. I, I really understand where they were coming from a lot better. But the book stands. It's fairly accurate, I think. Yeah. So um, as you were, as you were, well, first, let's tell the audience a little bit about the premise of the book. Well, I was born before the war, and uh, as as a, an infant, my father joined up when when Australia decided to help Britain and fight the war in Europe and against the Germans and the Italians and everybody. Sort of all the all the young men. My father was only twenty four at that stage. They all put on their uniforms and and left home. Uh, you know, my father didn't go overseas. He he uh, joined the air force and became part of uh, air transport, basically flying VIPs around the country and delivering supplies and bits and pieces. So he had a pretty good time of it, really. Uh, he went from being uh, riding a bicycle to work. Uh, at Ford Motor Company, where he was a clerk, uh, which he hated. Uh, when, when he married, uh, he was a university student, which was pretty unusual in Australia. We only had a handful of, we had a, a university in each of the major cities, Melbourne was being one of them. So all his mates were all sons of very wealthy people. They were sort of the the glitterati of Melbourne, if you like, they were all barristers and doctors and surgeons and all that kind of level. Uh, and he was he was studying piano at Melbourne Uni, um, and he was very good at it. He used to play with the famous American um, jazz bands, you know, and people at that level. So all of a sudden, he was married and. Uh, not going to uni and all his mates were still gallivanting around in their eastern suburbs homes and their Rolls Royces and exotic life. And he was riding a bike to work for the Ford Motor Company and hating it and making very poor wages and no longer living with his wealthy mother who had bought him a new Mercury Ford uh, and uh, such things like that. He didn't even have a piano, which he really missed. So he was happy to join up and go off to the war. And as it turned out, he didn't even leave Australia hardly. That's that's what. <laughs> yeah. And then tell us about your mom. Well, my mom was, was an only child until she was 12. And uh, her father was a, was a working man, a tradesman. He built rowing skips, the skulls that college mm. kids use, basically. Uh, so he was he was had a very fine eye for for quality woodworking. Um, he built his he built it built all the furniture in his home and and he was good at stuff like that. But he was a a mason and an ardent anti-Catholic. And uh, my mother daren't mention that she was dating a Catholic. That would have been horrible. That's part of the title of the book, really, is the wars were was very big thing back in the 30s, Australia, the battle between the Catholics and the Protestants. Um, they were it was sort of almost like a racial thing, you know, like like we endure now. Um, so she was suddenly the sister of twins who were born when she was about 12. And she went from being the idolized uh, sole child to being after school babysitter and take the children out in the pram. And she hated all that. And so when she was 14, she left school and got an apprenticeship as a fitter and uh, tailor at a big, uh, big emporium in, in uh, Melbourne, Meyer. And she learned how to get Vogue magazine all the time and read all the fashions and uh, 
And plus the people who came into Maya came in to see her department to have tailor-made clothes made. So she got to meet all the rich people of Melbourne and she was just became a snob herself. She she dedicated herself to learning all their mannerisms and their little fetishes and whatever. So when she met my father, she was quite good at mixing with all those sort of socialites as she'd always sort of aspired to be there. And that's what attracted her to him, I decided. Mm. Yeah. And then that's the main part of the story is the, um, as the Australian men were gone, the Yanks came, soldiers came to Australia and all that, the impact of all of that on your, on your young life. You know, one of the things that I really admired the whole time I was reading it, I never doubted for one second that child wrote that book. <laughs> you, right. you so captured the authenticity of young Peter. And I don't think that's easy, right? So but did, did you find that challenging? Did you sometimes find yourself stepping out of, of the young Peter's point of view and an older, wiser Peter inserted himself? Or how did, how did you keep that authentic voice throughout the book? Yeah, that's a good question. It's it isn't there all the time. I have to sit down and sort of go into a, a meditative state and, and just go back there for some reason. Like, I don't have a particularly good memory of what I had for breakfast this morning, let alone uh, what was going on 80 years ago. Uh, but I seem to be able to sit down at the typewriter and sink back into that time i get in touch with the emotions i i, I can feel the tension in my body i i, I feel the, the fear i i felt scared as a child uh, and the war didn't help either you know because the war uh, the war actually came to melbourne we weren't bombed but we we had the rationing and the blackouts and the gun emplacements and the shops of the rationing and all these bloody Americans. They suddenly just turned up in the middle of the night. We had no idea they were coming. It was just a couple of weeks after Pearl Harbor and 5,000 Americans just turned up in Melbourne. And Melbourne was um, not much more than a million population. So they made so it. Uh, and also all the Australian men, all the young eligible men, the they were off fighting the war in Europe and North Africa. So they made a heck of an impact, the Americans, on Australia, because they were very flash compared to the Australian troops. The Australian troops had sort of woolly, furry outfits and big boots, and they they didn't. The Americans came and they had very slick sort of uh, cotton uniforms, gleaming smiles, uh, uh, Australian and lots of money too. The American soldiers mm -hmm. uh, were paid quite considerably more than the Australians. The Australians could be lucky to buy a bottle of beer a week, a seven fifty bottle of beer. That was sort of about their celebratory week. Wow. Whereas the Americans could, they they actually took over the social life of my mother and her sister and the next door neighbor and uh, they used to go to a club in town that the it was open for the servicemen and the servicemen were all 95 percent americans because all the australians uh, were off um so she loved that she she uh she she became uh a camp follower almost you know that uh, they would they would my mother because she was very good at sewing and, and making clothes and very fashionable she used to be able to whip up things on her little she had a treadle sewing machine at home it was nothing flash we lived in a cold water flat uh, um, it was very cold <laughs> Uh, but she used to make clothes for herself and and her girlfriends and they would be up on the kitchen table having the hams checked and I'd be sitting under the table by a little single bar radiator that we had uh, for our 
solace. Gets cold in Melbourne, and you know we we have frosts, and uh, it's uh, the the pipes can freeze just about if you're not careful. And, mm. Yeah. So yeah, that was her glamour. That was her pleasure in life, and she would go to the dugout with her friends, her sister Roma and Pearl, and uh, they'd pick up a couple of. GIs and next thing they're coming home in a taxi with lots of bootleg sly grog that the Americans could afford to pay a premium price for and it was a luxury my mother's got drinks and cigarettes and uh, that was about what it amounted to I don't remember anything much chewing gum I used to get the stick chewing gum and that was mm -hmm. a real giveaway at school. The teachers and the neighbours knew straight away that uh, I was having an American influence. We didn't have stick chewing gum mm -hmm. in Australia. So I was kind yeah. of always defending. How many Americans are sleeping at your place, Peter? Uh, uh, none, or just a couple. Or <laughs> it, was, uh, it was embarrassing. Yeah, um, it must have been hot. How old were you? Well, I, I was only four or five uh, at the time of Pearl Harbor, and, and uh, a year later, my mother managed to get me into school. Uh, I, I turned uh, five a couple of weeks after I started school, and she was delighted to see me go off. She really loved being single again. Uh, she, she'd never wanted a child. In fact, uh, that's part of the story in a way. I think she uh, started a rumour that she might be pregnant and that was how she came to get married. She was very enthused about getting out of her parents' home and getting away. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. I'm sorry. I it's okay. Didn't turn off my phone. I didn't hear anything. Excellent. It's That's fine. So so, do you so do that was a of... lot for a little guy. That was a real. That was a lot to see. Um, this book is what I admire. Besides the the voice and the emotion, um, you know, it it reads like a novel. You know, it's it's like you the the chapters are fast. They're quick, and you're you're hanging on every word, and you want to know what, you know, what happened next. And sometimes I teared up. But you also have a wonderful sense of humor, and you had a, <laughs> which is which is a wonderful thing when a heavy emotional story is being told to be able to uh, to make people laugh. And so the book does that both those things. This um, show is called "What Are You Reading? What Are You Writing?" So now we've talked about the writing part, but I wonder if there was any book in your life that had a big impact on you either personally or or in your writing <laughs> it's it's really weird because as a child i i used to take solace in books and uh, biggles was without doubt my favorite w e johns wrote biggles and he wrote deerfoot and he wrote a commando whose name i've forgotten but I had everything that they'd ever written, but, uh, you know, like that was the 1940s and Spitfires and excitement of the war. So it was all kind of relevant. But now, now I'm, uh, it's only, it's only in more my adult life, in my late adult life, that I've actually become aware that we have Aborigines in Australia, in the state of Victoria, where I grew up. I don't remember ever seeing an Aborigine. You know, it was it was quite oh. unusual. And uh, but now there are well, the probably the most the most uh, telling book I've read in in recent years is written by a man called Bruce Pascoe, who is an Aboriginal Indigenous man himself, and he wrote a book called Dark Emu, <clears throat> which has been very successful in Australia particularly, but it's doing quite world, world, well worldwide. And he's written about what life was like for the Aborigines pre-colonial settlement. And 
we grew up, I grew up going to the matinees on Saturday, the matinee cinema and seeing cowboy and Indian films. And uh, we always barrack for the cowboys, the Indians were the bad guys. And uh, it was like that in Australia too. And no one's made the films really. It's only just starting to happen that the, a lot of Aborigines now in the last couple of decades have access to university education. They've become really good writers and poets. And um, Bruce Pascoe really created quite a sensation with his book, Dark Emu. It's a great read and I really enjoyed it. There's quite a quite a lot of other Aboriginal writers coming through and uh, they're all worth reading. But probably the most popular writer in Australia currently that I've enjoyed is uh, a man called Trent Dalton. And he's uh, a young journalist who's got a, a really great flair, really worth reading. And he, he's written a book called Boy Swallows Universe and... Uh, I'd highly recommend that to anyone. It, it's it's fun. It's it's really fun and Thank unbelievable. You. Mm. Do you happen to have a copy of your book's cover? No, not yet. I, oh, I do. It <laughs> just, just so happens. Let's, like, let's show everybody. Uh, now it's blurred because but, your background is blurred. Um that's yeah. that's good. I, I have my <laughs> oh dear. Uh I I blurred the background and I don't know where to yeah, put it. Yeah, so again. now the book can't really be seen. Oh, yep, yep, we're getting closer. There you go. There it is. Heaters Wars, and it's plural. Yeah, right. a memoir. That's, the that's Yanks really have invaded. Where do they sleep? The cover, the cover says. Uh, um, that's very good. And we can see it. <laughs> Thank you. That's excellent. Excellent. It is a wonderful, wonderful book. My audience, I hope you will read it. Peter, where can people find you? Especially all the Americans who are watching this. Right. Well, I'm a bit of a Luddite when it comes to being online. I haven't got the thousand different links, but you can reach me on Facebook and through through the publishing company, the people who printed my book, uh, Big Sky, uh, they they have both got websites that are available, um, and I'll probably uh, feel after talking to you, Karen, uh, as though I should maybe expand my uh, my uh, online presence. But, uh, but you certainly can reach me through Facebook, and if you just put my name in, uh, Peter Geddes, uh, uh, it It'll seems to be up. the one. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Well, this has been such a wonderful conversation. It's so nice actually having a chance to talk to you because usually I just see you kind of walking, walking behind Willa <laughs> you know, when, we're, when we're online. So it's lovely having this conversation. I hope all of you have enjoyed it as much. I hope you will check out Peter's Wars. It's a really worthwhile um powerful read and i hope you will be in touch with peter go go to see him on go to his facebook page and when you do please tell him that you met him on what are you reading what are you writing until next week everybody have a great great week bye goodbye Bye, Karen. Peter. thank you